Hi, kitty cats. Today on the show, I'm going to talk about how to persist more of your thoughts so that you appear more productive. My initial impressions on Annie Murphy Paul's book, uh, The Extended Mind. Also, the science that I believe is behind my recent Gender as Mediator article. And then finally, the lack of science in Christian thought regarding gender. I am Amethyst Herrick. This is the Dingbat Diaries for the week of July 20th, 2023. This is a show where all I do is talk about the things that hit my head during the week previous. And all of this work, all of my writing, my videos, the podcasts that I do, these are supported by sus subscribers to my Substack publication. If you are a subscriber, I'm thanking you already. If you are not, and if you like this content, Substack, my Substack publication, there's going to be a link in the notes to this video. By all means, go and check it out. If you like it, I would appreciate it if you subscribed. All right, how to be more productive. I've had uh, friends of mine tell me that I appear very productive. And I would say relative to some of my colleagues, you know, I'm actually maybe a bit lackadaisical. I, I know people who are capable of, of putting out you know, two to four articles in a day. And, and I have tended to do two to four articles in a week. That being said, I do a bunch of other things, a podcast, videos, etc. all of this. And also in my career, I have tended to be a source of ideas. I tend to be kind of an idea person, whether I was a developer or a team leader, a manager, I tend to be sort of the person who ends up with a lot of ideas. Now, what I believe is that I don't generate more ideas than other people. What I do is persist more ideas than other people. And as a result, that makes me look like I've got a whole lot more. The, you know, this isn't exactly rocket science. The first tip I would give you is get a notebook with a pen right next to it and write things down. You know, as you get, um, as you get ideas, write them down. So I'm using a notebook here for initially writing down uh, the ideas that I come up with. I'm use I also use a computer, a note-taking system on my computer, which I'm using now for these show notes. And, you know, I have a lot more to say on the ideas of productivity and, you know, how to, how to spur more ideas, how to, how to keep ideas flowing. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to limit it now just to saying, uh, you know, one, one quick tip that I had. And this actually happened, I think it was last week. I believe it was last week. I went for a walk and I started having some ideas, what I thought were good ideas. And when you're walking, believe it or not, hard to write in a notebook. Maybe you've experienced that. If you haven't, you haven't taken a notebook with you walking. But what I realized is I do have an application on my phone. Now I have a Pixel phone, so it's an Android phone. But I have an app on my phone called Google Recorder. And what Recorder can do is transcribe, so it records, you know, at least truth in advertising there, that's good. But what it will do is record what it is you have to say and then transcribe it. Whatever your words were, it turns it into actual text. It uploads the file, the actual audio file, as well as the transcription to, I think it's recorder.google.com. I think as the I start typing something in and it comes up, you know, the first time. But what that means is I can actually take and copy and paste that transcription into my note-taking system here on my computer. So the takeaway from this, you know, like I said, I've got a lot more that I would like to discuss on this topic, but the real takeaway is that I don't have a whole ton, a, a, a huge ton of good ideas. You have good ideas all the time. I'm sure as many good ideas as I do. My only distinction is that I try to persist them. I write them down when I have the ideas, and now I've discovered using Google Recorder works really well because I just was out walking. I had headphones on with a, a microphone and I think I recorded, I mean, probably 10 minutes worth of myself talking that I later transcribed into, into my note-taking system. So that's pretty cool. So I don't have any more ideas than you do. You've got plenty. And if you feel you don't, 
I think it's only because you're not writing them down. Um, write them down. Uh, ten bucks says you're going to be a lot more productive. And I, I actually will not honor that ten bucks thing, just so you know. All right. Moving on to the next topic. Why did I bother pulling out my phone? You know, so that I could even talk about using Google Recorder two minutes ago. A minute ago. I started reading a book called The Extended Mind. This is a book by Annie Murphy Paul. Um, the thesis of the book, and I actually got this, uh, I actually got the, the reference to the book from another book by uh, Tiago Forte, is the guy's name. Uh, he has a book called um, Building a Second Brain, I believe is, that, is the name of that book. What uh, Annie Murphy Paul says, her big um, thesis is that cognition is not what she calls brain bound. Cognition does not take place only in the head. That when you're thinking, when you're emoting, when you're doing whatever else, it's not just a, a process in your head. It's not just a neural process. Uh, she brings up that we think in many different ways. And in particular, the prologue, which I found very, um, very provocative, very thought-provoking, the prologue brings up how our cognition can actually be augmented by, um, by very simple actions. I say augmented, she called it extended, that your cognition can be extended by things like bodily movement. Perhaps not a surprise, going for a walk is one of those. Let's call back to that last section, right? Bodily movement, speaking with others, her idea of, of, of spreading cognition of an idea across a group, sort of a fascinating idea there, but then also updating the environment to foster creativity. And, and I'm sure you've seen, if you've worked in technology, I'm sure you've gone through at least two changes uh, where you have, you know, the standard uh, desks and, and cubicles, and then suddenly they turn it into this wide open thing, and then everybody annoys everybody until you move right back to cubicles, but then some, you know, management hack, sorry, management hacks, I was a management hack, so I can make these jokes. Um, so management hack says, oh yeah, but we have to get, you know, more, more, um, you know, more interaction among people. And so they go back to this wide open thing. Anyway, updating our environment to foster this creativity. So those are three, those are three ways that Annie Murphy Paul brings up to augment our cognition. And these are not based on the brain. They are based on outside us but they affect our cognition. Now, interestingly, the subsequent chapters have not inspired me the same way as this prologue did, but I, I did have an inspiration, and it so happened um, when I was walking and I pulled out my recorder like I just talked about. I figured because social environment will play a part in cognition, um, and this means, you know, both physical uh, surroundings, uh, our activities, it could be the people that we talk to. It implied, at least to me, that our thought is an extension of sorts of our social environment. And this is part of, part of what Annie Murphy Paul uh, discusses. But our, our cognition actually extends into the social environment. And if that is true, because I believe identity, and in particular gender, are part of, you know, are, are in some way part of the social environment. They are more than just influenced by that social environment. If, if our cognition extends into so the said social environment, our identity and our gender are part of. They extend into that social environment. And as a result, I mean, this is exactly, actually where I came up with the idea of gender being a mediator between the deeply seated motivations that we have and the expectations of our social environment. So I'm thinking I, that made me consider the idea that part of how we contribute to our social environment is by extending into it, our cognition into it. And that's how our cognition becomes part of and helps the social environment evolve because, of course, every single one of us is part of society and helps it evolve and uh, move forward. So 
those were some of the initial ideas I, I got from the Extended Mind. Um, so far, I'm finding it a fascinating read that, you know, that cognition can be so affected by very minor things. I mean, those, I used to hate people would come to meetings, those little fidget things. You know, some guy sitting in the back of a meeting going, zzz, 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 and you're trying to give a presentation, right? You're like, well, last month's, you know, TPS report shows, and there's the guy in the back zizzing. And I'm like, God, cut your zizzing. But it turns out something like those fidgeting actually improve cognition. It's kind of a fascinating concept. So those are some of the first impressions that I got from the extended mind. Should I end up um, getting more? I will absolutely, you know, report back. The reason why I wanted to bring that up, and there's kind of an evolution in my uh, the topics that I'm discussing today, the reason why I wanted to bring that up is because I wanted to get into my article of gender as mediator. Because I think there, a good question that somebody would ask at some point is, how scientific is this article? I mean, and it's a great question just, just to ask in general how scientific, I'm going to put that in air quotes, is gender theory kind of period. So my article, if you've not read it, I will link it uh, in the notes to this um, video. But my article is based on observations. These are, these are observations that each of us knows aspects of our identity, but we don't really know why we know them. There are certain things that we know, that we continue to believe, that we may try to change, but we can't because we just know them. And, and if something's, you know, if we, if we know that something's wrong, it's really hard to, to change the perception that something is wrong. These are things that just plain make sense to us when we get down to it. You know, we look at, um, uh, it, I mean, it could be anything from the idea that well, in my article, I said that broccoli tastes bad, which is funny because I actually kind of like broccoli. I mean, I love broccoli. When I was a kid, you know, if we had vegetables for dinner, um, you know, I would want broccoli. I don't think my sisters agreed. It doesn't make a difference because what does make a difference is that I knew that. I knew that then. I know that now. But at the very least, you know, the late President George Bush, I guess President 41, right? George Herbert Walker Bush. I think. Some historian out there will fact check me. Thank you. Absolutely said I hate broccoli. I mean, I remember seeing this and I thought, gosh, what a weirdo. What the hell? It's broccoli. It's good. Anyway, let's move on. Because the, the point is that sometimes our expression in a social environment results in a lot of friction. And I believe that, that this friction, at least some of it, uh, is what defines gender dysphoria, which I believe very strongly every person experiences just as a part of growing up in a society. There is another article that I wrote about that that, uh, you know, I also will link in the show notes. So I mentioned this as an observation. I'm saying this is, you know this, but I think it's, it, somebody would be able to say, well, where's the science there? I got no facts. I got no figures. I got no, you know, zero point zero plus or minus whatever and so i think somebody might get might get the impression that this can't be real that my idea can't be real because it's not based in science science but i want to bring up albert einstein possibly one of the 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 most well-known scientists of all times was purported to have claimed and i don't know the truth of this but he's purported to have claimed that scientists do not think in equations, which is true at the very least. I can't imagine some physicists sitting out there and going, oh yeah, totally, we got, uh, you know, force equals ma. When Newton was looking at Newtonian mechanics, he based that on observations. He started looking at observations, he started looking at the real world because science is observation first. Equations can only come after you've observed, and then you try to explain your observations. So the job of a scientist, as I learned in graduate school, to become a scientist, is to learn to observe without judging right off the bat. Because when you, when you try to take data 
that you're already judging, you end up taking data that uh, is gonna, going to satisfy what you want it to, to say. Um, there was actually a, a Medium article by Walter Ryan recently where he brings up um, alternative remedies to, so alternative medicine, I guess we could call it, and he, he makes the point that Western medicine tends to look at these things and go, well, we don't know why that works, so it's probably crap. But when I say science is observation, if you have something and it works, then, then it works. You can't just deny that because we don't know why it is something works. The fact that it works kind of shows it does. I mean, it's kind of circular, but run with it. So to return to my article, the, the science, what I feel the science in my article, it comes from observing human behavior. Science is not just genetics. It's not Watson and Crick taking x-ray crystallography of DNA. It's not, you know, mapping out the human genome. It's not these things. It is observation. And if you ignore behavior that we can observe, that is just as foolish as ignoring genetics which I don't want to do. I believe that both genetics and behavior play a part, at least in my theory, indirectly, because those are expected to be, um, you know, th those are both sides of the equation, either the foundation of the behavior or the implementation of said behavior. I exist in the middle. My theor theory exists in the, in the middle that gender is a mediator between these two things the origin and the implementation. And as a result, because my theory is based on observations, I believe my theory of gender is scientific. Also, I'm a scientist, so it's easy for me to say that. <laughs> All right, my last topic today, the lack of science in the anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. This is typically brought up by Christians, and so that's why I think when I publish my article about gender as a mediator, it is likely that I'd see some pushback from, of course, pro, you know, proponents of the anti-LGBTQ uh, rhetoric that is sort of prevalent today. Um, primarily, we're looking at conservatives. Primarily, we're looking at Christians. I don't want to make any super sweeping gener uh, generalizations, but, you know, it's, it's, it's largely kind of true. So, if I were to talk about this rhetoric here, it is founded, first of all, on equating sex, a biological concept, with gender, a behavioral concept, an expression concept. And the, the way this goes is that if you have an XY genotype, you are necessarily going to have a male body, which has a penis, and that means that you must express your sexual, your sex characteristics as a man who likes women, is attracted to women. This is the anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, to start from this idea that sex and gender are identical. Now this breaks down purely by observation. I mean, you can, you, it is very simple to say genetics does not bear out that every person with an XY genotype necessarily has the characteristics that follow in this theory. And I've written extensively about this. I couldn't even link all of the things in the show notes uh, that I've written about this. But suffice it to say, there is plenty of evidence that says that you could have an XY genotype and not ex express the characteristics that, that follow in the anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. I'm living proof, if nothing else. An XY genotype ultimately ends up only as a, a probability that you may express those, those characteristics. And some of those are behavioral. And you may or may not know why those, those behavioral characteristics exist, but if you observe them, then clearly they do. So I think uh, the point that I want to go toward here is to say, why do I think um, I'm going to be, I'm going to see pushback from Christians? I have a lot more that I want to develop around this idea, but my theory is in part, as I mentioned, observe, uh, uh, comes uh, from observing, wow, 
My theory is in part based upon observations we can make of nature, not just humans, not just behavior, but plenty of evidence from the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, plenty of evidence that, that, there's, that there are um, social roles that uh, make a gender and there are biological roles that make up sex. And these can change. I mean, even sex characteristics can change. Gender characteristics can change in the animal kingdom. Christians, however, when I say this happens in the animal kingdom, therefore they would happen in humans, that's where I think I'm going to experience the pushback. Because Christians, at least in the Bible, it says that, that humans are not the same as animals. Humans are supposed to have, you know, Adam was supposed to have been given dominion over the earth. All that swims in the water, all that walks in the land. Forget the exact quote from Genesis. But a Christian would not believe that humans can be compared to animals. So, because of humans were like the rest of nature, I think it would be pretty obvious th that it's foolish to equa equate sex and gender because we've got a multitude of, e of uh, evidence against that. It just happens to come from fish or hyenas or other primates. It actually comes from humans too, but this is where we can deny it by saying, well, but God said we were different. Um, I have a whole lot more to expand on here, but I think, in part, the reason why um, the reason why my gender theory might experience a little bit of pushback, at least from uh, Christian proponents, is Christian proponents of, a, of a, the uh, the opposite opinion, is going to be because Christians will say, "Yeah, but humans are different," you know, and so I can just throw out your entire theory. You may observe these things, but Christ but humans are different. We're supposed to be different. God made us different. We're not a hyena. Do you feel like a hyena? Actually, I kind of feel like a hyena. Wouldn't that be cool if you could get sort of the spots of a hyena? Just, you know, you're just walking down the streets, street and you see somebody in all the spots. I think that'd be fun, personally. I think we would all laugh a lot more, right? Like hyenas. And on that note, I think it's time to close down this particular episode of the Dingbat Diaries Weekly for the week of July 20th, 2023. I hope you enjoyed this content. I hope it made you laugh or I hope it made you think. If you did enjoy it, if it did any of those things, please like the video, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. And of course, if you really, really liked it, please find my Substack publication from the link in the show notes and subscribe there uh, so that you can support more content just like this. Uh, on that note, I will see you next week for the Dingbat Diaries weekly week of, oh, I got to do math, July 27th, 2023. Bye.